Okay. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to yet another week of Birds of Newfoundland, which does not want to, there, there we go, advance to the next slide. Um, it's really great to see so many of you out here again, and it's fantastic to see so many of the same names coming up week after week. Uh, that's really what we were hoping for when we designed this, although, of course, people are welcome to come to just one if that strikes their interest, but it's fantastic that so many people are coming back week after week, so we're really excited to see that. Uh, and today's presentation, I'm really, really excited about because I have to say that warblers are my favorite species or my favorite group. Um, I know it's all about the seabirds here in Newfoundland, but I am a songbird person at heart. So I'm really excited to talk to you about warblers. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, I'm Catherine. Uh, I am the coordinator of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas and helping me run things today is Jenna McDermott who I believe is here, although she may have gone off to troubleshoot some technological issues. Um, anyway, Jenna is the assistant coordinator for the Atlas, and she will be monitoring the chat and trying to answer some questions that pop up there. Uh, we just ask that you keep your microphones muted for the duration of the presentation, um, just because there are quite a few of us, and so it could get a little bit distracting if people don't have themselves on mute. Uh, you can unmute yourself at any time if you have a question, or there'll be time for questions at the end as well, I hope. Uh, now, apologies again to those of you who have heard this many times at this point, because we do have some people coming back. Um, but just, just for those who are here for the first time, Jenna and I both work for Birds Canada, uh, which is an NGO, and it's considered Canada's voice for birds. So it's the leading science-based bird conservation organization in the country. And we work to improve the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of Canada's wild birds and their habitats. And we do this through a number of programs. So we, we conduct a lot of scientific programs. We establish partnerships with other organizations, with government, with industry. Um, and a lot of our programs are citizen science-based, uh, which means that they are um, essentially made up of people like you who volunteer their time and their skills to go out and collect bird data and so this stat is actually quite out of date. I think we're actually up to around 50,000 volunteers nationwide each year. Uh, so Birds Canada is a national organization. We have offices across the country. And uh, yeah, we've had, we've had really great luck with fantastic volunteers coming out and helping us with our programs. Uh, here in Newfoundland, we're relatively recent. So we only... Uh, established our Newfoundland outpost in 2019. Uh, and our primary um, goal here in Newfoundland is to conduct the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Uh, so what that is briefly, for those of you who haven't heard, it's a big citizen science project, takes place over five years, and it's an effort to map the uh, distribution and the abundance of all of the species of birds that breed here on the island of Newfoundland. Uh, so obviously it's a huge endeavor, uh, but what we're trying to do is create maps like the map you see there for the yellow warbler. Um, so this map is the data that's been collected so far over the past two breeding seasons. Um, and the squares show places where yellow warblers have been found for sure breeding in red or possibly breeding in orange and yellow. Uh, so that's what we're aiming to do. And anybody who's interested in learning more about the Atlas, uh, you can come on out to our presentation on April the 4th. Uh, where I'll be going through how you take part in the Atlas. You can also check out our website. And then the second program that we run here in Newfoundland is the Nocturnal Owl Survey. Um, so this is also a recent program. It only started here in Newfoundland and Labrador on, uh, in 2018, but it's been running in the other Atlantic provinces for 20 years now. Um, and so briefly what this involves is volunteers go out and survey a predetermined route for owls on one night between the 1st of April and the 15th of May each year. So it's only a one night commitment. Um, I'm going to be doing a presentation on owls and the owl survey as well on March 24th. Uh, so you can sign up for that if you're interested through our website or our Facebook. Uh, and I'll send out the link as well in this week's follow up email. Um, so just come on out to that if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the species of owls that we have in the Atlantic provinces or about how the survey works and what kind of interesting information we've gotten out of it and what we're hoping to get out of it for Newfoundland. And then finally, if you're interested in how you volunteer, I'll be going through that too for people who are uh, new to the survey. So that's all I'm gonna say about, uh, about those programs today. 
Uh, again, just briefly, we'd like to thank our sponsors, our partners and supporters. Uh, without them, we would not be able to do this atlas and we certainly would not be able to put on or, uh, presentations like this. Okay, so now on to the warblers. Like I said, very excited about this. Um, they were sort of the first birds that really caught my interest when I started birding. Um, they are all in one family, the Perulidae family. And generally speaking, they're small, very active birds, uh, which can be irritating if you're trying to get binoculars on them. They move around a lot, uh, but they're really neat to watch. They usually have thin, short, pointed bills. Uh, they're often very colorful, which is what catches people's attention. Uh, and most species eat primarily insects, um, at least during the breeding season. So that, that thin, short, pointed bill is actually perfect for insect eating. Uh, most species of warblers are also arboreal, by which I mean they spend most of their time in trees. That is not true of all species of warblers, but again, the majority. So we're going to go through the species of warblers that breed here in Newfoundland today um, with the same caveats that we, we've uh, had in previous weeks. So we're going to focus on species that breed here and we're going to focus on breeding plumage. Um, and when we're doing this, just a, a few things to sort of keep in mind, uh, things to think about when you're trying to identify a warbler. So think about the size. Now, I said they're all small birds, and they are, you know, relative to something like a Canada jay, a warbler is very small, but there is size difference. There are size differences within the warbler family as well. So think about the size of the warbler. Think about the shape and the size of the bill. Um, occasionally the coloration, but mostly the shape and the size. And you want to be looking at the length of the wings and tail as well. So a lot of the warblers are described as short-tailed species or long-tailed species. And you can look at the length of the wings relative to uh, the tail too. Uh, coloration, of course, is a big one, particularly during the breeding season. And as I said, that's what we're going to focus on today. Uh, so you want to be looking at the face. You want to look for facial markings. Uh, a lot of them have pretty um, fancy looking faces. You want to look at wing markings too. So for example, in this bay breast of warbler, you can see two very nice wing bars. Uh, and you want to look at the under, under tail coverts, by which I mean this area right in here. Um, and the reason that you want to look at that, well, partly the, the under tail coverts and their color relative to the tail can be a diagnostic cue for some species. The other thing is it's nice that that can be a diagnostic cue because a lot of warblers like to hang out in the canopy. And that means that this is the part of the bird that you see, you see it from underneath. Uh, so looking at the color of those undertail coverts can be the easiest thing to do and can also tell you a lot. Um, and finally, of course, like all birding, you wanna consider the habitat that you're seeing a species in and its behavior. Now, I did say that we are going to focus on birds that breed, at least occasionally in Newfoundland, and focusing on breeding plumage. And this is really important for warblers because most of them look totally different in the summer than they do during the rest of the year. And so I wanted to take a moment to just briefly go over how molt works in birds. Uh, I once accidentally insulted a friend of mine who I didn't realize was studying molt by telling him that it was akin to watching paint dry. Uh, which perhaps wasn't the nicest thing I could have said to him, but it's actually, a, it's relatively simple to understand and it's kind of an interesting thing to, to look into. So a lot of people do study molt. Um, this is how it works for most warblers. Uh, so most small birds anyway, this is not always true of larger birds, but most small birds molt their feathers at least once a year. And they do that in the fall. This is called the pre-basic molt. So this one, pretty much all passerines, the small perching birds, will undergo the pre-basic molt in the fall. Some of them will do that on the breeding grounds. Some of them will do it on the wintering grounds. Some of them will do it on migration. Uh, but just about everybody is undergoing this pre-basic molt and they molt into what, they call, what we call basic plumage. And that's the plumage that they're in during the winter. However, some birds, and by no means all of them, but most of the warblers, will then undergo a second molt in spring, which is called the pre-alternate molt. And they molt into their alternate plumage or their breeding plumage. And that's what we see here on the breeding, um, on the breeding grounds during the height of the breeding season. So this is the plumage that we're gonna be talking about today, alternate plumage. Now, as I said, 
birds can undergo pre-basic molt on the breeding grounds as well as on the wintering grounds. And many of our warblers do molt on the breeding grounds or on migration. And so when you see warblers in the fall, things start to get extremely confusing. Um, I am currently trying to talk Nature NL into doing a workshop on uh, fall warblers because that is far beyond my abilities. Things get very confusing in the fall. So for now, we're going to focus on the alternate plumage. And then the other thing that I just wanted to touch on before we get going is bird song. Uh, I have by no means included the songs of all of the warbler species that we're looking at tonight. Uh, it's learning warbler songs is not something you can do in just an hour. It's something that I'm still working quite hard at. Uh, but what I've tried to do is pick out some of the most distinctive songs, which are good to start with. And once you can start picking out one or two songs from the crowd, you can kind of work your way up from there. If you're interested in learning more about birding by ear, uh, Jenna is going to be doing a webinar for us on, uh, on that on April 11th, which will actually be the last one of this series. So come on out and learn a little bit more about birding by ear then. Um, but I did just want to touch on the fact that birds really have two main uh, purposes for their song. So they use songs to attract mates and they use songs to defend their territories. Those are the kind of two main purposes that we know of. And in a lot of cases, warblers will actually have two distinct song types, often referred to as uh, type A and type B song, uh, one for each purpose. And so really today, I've just pulled one distinctive song for each of the species that I've included song for. Uh, but if you hear birds uh, making more than one kind of distinctive song, that would be why they do have more than one type of song. And that's a good thing to keep in mind. Okay, so on to our warbler species. I didn't put up an outline today because it would basically just be a long list of species. It's all one family today. So the first bird we're gonna talk about is the oven bird. So this is a chunky little warbler. You actually might not think he's a warbler because he spends most of his time on the ground in the leaf litter where he walks with a hesitating gait. Uh, I believe Cornell's All About Birds did say something about him looking like a chicken, but uh, that seems a little unfair to the oven bird. Um, oven birds are also ground nesters, uh, and their name actually comes from the fact that they build a distinctive domed nest on the forest floor with a side entrance, so it looks like a little Dutch oven. Um, so that's where the oven bird gets its name, and oven birds like undisturbed mature forest. So things you're looking for when you're trying to identify an oven bird, um, you've got an olive brown back, and then you've got this uh, chest with black streaks on it. Um, and that really helps it blend into the leaf litter on the forest floor. Uh, so you've also got an orange and black striped crown, but that can actually be quite difficult to see. Uh, so generally speaking, these, these guys are pretty camouflaged. And then you've got a white eye ring here, uh, which is characteristic of the oven bird. The song, this is actually one of the more distinctive songs that you'll hear. Uh, it's a loud, insistent, teacher, 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 and it gets louder as it goes. Uh, so even though these guys spend most of their time on the forest floor, they can actually sing from quite high up in the canopy. Um, so I'll play the song for you now. So you can see that it gets louder and more insistent as it goes. Um, did everybody hear that okay? Jenna, can you maybe let me know that that worked all right since? Uh... Yep, that worked good from here. Perfect, thank you. All right, just making sure technology will sometimes fail you. Um, so I think one of the neat things about that song, which I'll, I'll play again quickly. So to me, each of those sounds like two notes, but it turns out that each of those teachers is made up of three to five different notes and the number of notes in each part and how they're sung actually varies among individuals. So while all oven birds sound exactly the same to us, uh, they sound completely different to each other. So their songs are actually quite an individual calling card, which I think is really cool. Okay, so our next warbler. Again, you might not think he's a warbler. Uh, this is the Northern Water Thrush. So he's a relatively large warbler, a little less chunky than the oven bird. So long legs, a long body, a little more slim looking. Um, He's quite thrush-like, hence the name, water thrush, uh, which helps if you have a search image for thrushes. Uh, they're very common 
in Newfoundland. Uh, they're usually found in the forest understory near slow moving or standing water. Uh, so they'll forage for insects along uh, on the ground along the water's edge. And they will often uh, be seen bobbing or teetering their tail and rear body up and down. Uh, so I, I have a test question. I'm interested to see answers in the chat. A couple weeks ago when I did the shorebirds presentation, I said that there was a shorebird that you could recognize by that teetering, bobbing um, uh, maneuver. Can anybody remember what species that was that I said? Just see if anyone remembers this. I see blankness in the chat. Yellow legs spotted. Okay, yeah, the consensus seems to be the spotted sandpiper, and that is true. It's the spotted sandpiper that has that distinctive bobbing movement. So way to go. That's very impressive. Good memory from two weeks ago. Um, okay, back to the warblers. Brief diversion into sandpipers there. Uh, so you can look for that bobbing movement in the water thrush as well. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. There we go. Um, so things you're looking for in a northern water thrush. You've got this heavily streaked breast and belly, a brown back and wings, and a nice buffy or light colored eyebrow that stretches over top of the eye. Uh, on some individuals, the breast and the belly, and you can see it a little bit here, and they can have a little bit of a yellow wash, so you can see some yellow colorations there. Uh, the eyebrow itself can be buffy or white in color. Um, I've also got a song for these guys, and this, this one I think is kind of interesting because it's one that I had a lot of trouble learning at first, and then somehow in my head I associated it with a ball bouncing down the stairs, and that works for me. Um, I'm sure that Jenna will tell you if you go to her workshop on, on the 11th of April that birding by ear is kind of a personal thing. And a lot of the time uh, you kind of need to make up your own associations. Things sound different to different people. Uh, you know, I've heard people say, oh, it sounds exactly like this and I don't hear it at all. Uh, but for me, the water thrush sounds a lot like ball bouncing down the stairs. So it's these loud, emphatic, clear notes that fall in pitch and accelerate. So that's, uh, that's one that you can hear quite a lot. It's often one that I hear in um, Bidgood Park in St. John's. Uh, so it's one of the first ones I hear in the spring. Um, and I just wanted to, oh, thank you. That's enough water thrush. Um, they are pretty insistent, but uh, we're gonna move on now. I just wanted to take a moment to compare the oven bird and the water thrush because that is something that might be easy to confuse. Uh, because in both cases, you're talking about a fairly dark bird with a white streaked breast that spends a lot of its time on the ground. Um, so what you're looking for in the comparison, um, the water thrush is going to be darker brown above versus the oven bird, if you remember, was sort of a golden olive brown. Um, the oven bird has that white eye ring, and then it has that orange and black striped crown. Uh, the water thrush doesn't have any coloration on the crown, and instead of an eye ring, it has a buffy or white eyebrow. Um, the other thing to look at is habitat. So as their name suggests, water thrush are often found by water. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Okay, and yet another ground nesting warbler. Um, so this is one of our first warblers to arrive in spring. And uh, it does nest on the ground. And as we discussed when we were talking about the shorebirds, when you're nesting on the ground, one of your key nest defenses is camouflage. Uh, you don't want predators to be able to see the nest. And uh, black and white warblers, as it turns out, are particularly good at this. Uh, and as a student, I actually, I did some time working in a lab where one of the master students was studying black and white warblers and she was trying to find their nests. This was at a field station in Eastern Ontario. And she was getting incredibly frustrated by just how good these guys are at hiding their nests. One day, I remember she was saying that they had narrowed down a nest site to one meter squared on the forest floor, but they couldn't find the actual nest. Uh, so they're extremely cryptic. 
Um, just before I go on with the black and white warbler, I'm going to point out that most of the warblers I'm going to be talking about from here on in are sexually dimorphic. So that is, at least during the breeding season, males and females look different. Uh, and so for these warblers, I'll be showing the photo of the male on the left side and the photo of the female on the right side. Um, the other thing to note is that in most, but not all, uh, sexually dimorphic birds, the females do tend to have duller plumage than the males, which does make sense if they're doing the incubating of the eggs, they don't want to be drawing attention to the nest. Um, but the other thing that happened, I, as I realized, because females are often duller than males, people tend to take photos of the males, not so much the females. So we really had to scrounge for our female warbler photos here. Uh, and some of them may not be at the best angles, but we've done the best we can. Uh, so for the black and white warbler, these guys are medium sized warblers and they've got a thin bill, but the interesting thing about this is it's actually slightly decurved. So it's curved down rather than being straight. Um, you've got a black ear patch here. And then you've got black and white stripes on the breast and on the flank. And you can't see the tail properly here, but it's dark with white spots on the outer feathers. Uh, the females are kind of the same, uh, but paler overall. And instead of a black ear patch, they've got a grayish ear patch. And instead of this striped or spotted throat, they've got a white throat. And uh, they're often seen foraging on tree trunks and branches, kind of like a nuthatch. Uh, and one cool fact about the black and white warbler is they actually have an extra long hind claw and heavier legs than other warblers. And that helps them hold on to and move around on the bark of trees uh, because they do so much foraging like nuthatches. Uh, and this is another nice, easily recognizable song. I believe it was the second warbler song I ever learned. Uh, it sounds like this, it sounds like a squeaky wheel. So it's a high pitched squeaky wheel. It's a very distinctive song. So that's, that's an easy one to listen out for. And these guys are very common uh, throughout Newfoundland. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. So now moving on to non-ground nesting warbler, the Tennessee warbler. Uh, this one and the next one I struggle with a little bit. Uh, Tennessee warblers, as you can tell here, are not exactly our most colorful or distinctive warblers. Uh, however, they are relatively common um, in terms of breeding in Newfoundland. So they're a boreal forest breeder. Uh, they eat mainly caterpillars during the breeding season. And a uh, neat fact about the Tennessee warbler is during the winter, they eat nectar, which isn't that uncommon, uh, but they're a well-known nectar thief. So most nectar eating species, be it birds or bats or insects, they probe a flower from the front. And when they do that, it's the flower strategy that they get pollen on themselves, which they then spread to the next flower. Uh, but Tennessee warblers skip all that by piercing the flower at the bottom and lapping up the nectar from the bottom without getting any pollen on themselves. So they're, they're really kind of devious. Um, having just told you that I will arrange the male and the female, on the left and right of the screen. I haven't done that with the Tennessee warbler. And that's because despite all of the work by a number of birders here, we're not entirely sure which one is which with the Tennessee warbler. So uh, this is a case where there's not a lot of difference between the males and females. I said that the females are generally paler than the males, and this is true. But as you can tell, these guys are not overly colorful warblers to start off with. So it's actually quite difficult uh, to tell the difference between the, the males and the females. So these guys are small, short-tailed warblers, and they've got a thin pointy bill, but as you can tell, it's not decurved the way that the black and white warbler bill is. Uh, they they kind of, I said, when you're looking at coloration, look at face markings, look at wing markings, you're not gonna see a lot of that on the Nashville warbler. Um, so you do have a pale eyebrow here, uh, but it's not super distinctive. And then you've got a gray cap. Uh, they're yellow green above and they're whitish underneath. And as I said, females, I mean, according to all the books, they're basically the same as males, but duller. Um, I, we're not sure if this is a male or a female, but it does have a less distinct eyebrow. 
uh, than this guy. On the other hand, it's definitely got a nice yellow green back. So yeah, like I said, it, it there was a lot of discussion about this today. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about identifying Tennessee warblers to sex. I would just say, if you know that it's a Tennessee warbler, you're doing pretty well. Moving on to the Nashville warbler. Doesn't really look anything like the Tennessee warbler. And yet I still have trouble getting the two straight in my head. And I think that's because they're both named after locations and Nashville is actually in Tennessee, which just makes things even more confusing. Um, but while the Tennessee warbler is relatively common in Newfoundland, Nashville warbler is much rarer, so it's an uncommon breeder. Um, it likes regrowing deciduous or mixed forest. It really likes shrubby undergrowth. Uh, and it's worth noting, since I pointed out the difficulty of their names, uh, the Nashville warbler doesn't actually breed in Nashville or anywhere in Tennessee. Um, they got their name because that's where Alexander Wilson, who named a lot of the warbler species that we're talking about today, that's where he first saw one on migration. So he named it the Nashville warbler. When you're identifying these guys, these guys are relatively small warbler with very round head. Uh, they also have relatively plain plumage. I think they're a little bit fancier looking than the Tennessee warbler. Uh, but again, you don't see any of those bars on the wings. You see plain wings. Um, they do have this nice gray hood and a white eye ring, which, which is useful. They're yellow underneath with a short tail and an olive green back. Uh, and then again, we have a situation where the females and the immatures are paler than the males. There is this chestnut crown patch, but it's usually not really visible. I mean, if you look really hard at this photo, you can see some chestnut coloration in those feathers on the crown, uh, but it's, it's not an exceptionally visible IDQ. Okay, so moving on, we have the morning warbler. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's one that I had not seen before moving to Newfoundland, although they are found elsewhere. Uh, but they're a pretty common breeder in Newfoundland. They can be quite hard to see because they like to hang out in dense thickets and undergrowth. And uh, they are among, among the most renowned skulkers of the warbler family. So they're really good at skulking around and avoiding being seen. Um, but they're not, they're, they're pretty loud. So they're fairly easy to hear. They like early successional habitat. So habitat that's been recently disturbed by fires or by storms or by logging. Um, and because of this, sometimes they're referred to as a fugitive species. Um, that's because early successional habitat continues to change, right? And eventually becomes late successional habitat. Uh, and so they need to find new habitat as the, ha as, uh, the early successional habitat matures. Um, so something interesting to note about these guys is, again, uh, I feel that I'm referring back to the shorebirds a lot, but you'll remember that we talked about the broken wing displays that some of the shorebirds put on to lead uh, predators away from the nest. Male and female uh, morning warblers will do this as well. So they'll pretend to have a broken wing to lead you away from their nest. Uh, so this is another pretty chunky warbler. Um, we don't have any wing bars or eye rings. Uh, so that's one way you can tell the difference between morning warblers and Nashville warblers, with the, which also have the, the gray hood, but they have an eye ring. Morning warbler does not. Um, that being said, females and, and, and immatures sometimes have an incomplete eye ring. So uh, this warbler also has yellow underparts. It's got this gray hood and the males, the breeding males have a black chest. Um, again, we have a situation where females and immature males are paler than the adult males and they lack that black chest. And as I said, they can sometimes have this incomplete eye ring. Um, this is a nice recognizable song as well. It's sort of a kind of buzzy, churry, churry, churry. Uh, so that's one that you'll, you'll often hear. Uh, it's one that we heard a lot in central Newfoundland this summer. Okay. Moving on, common yellow throat. Uh, so I said that uh, the black and white warbler was the second warbler song that I learned. Common yellow throat was the very first warbler song that I learned. But there's a caveat to that. I learned it in Ontario. And when I moved to Newfoundland, 
I had to learn it all over again because the common yellow throats here actually do have their own dialect. So basically the common yellow throats here have a Newfoundland accent. Uh, they sound just a little bit different from the Ontario uh, common yellow throats, which is, is kind of a, was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, as the name kind of suggests, this is another common breeder in Newfoundland. These guys really like marshy habitats. So they like low wet areas with dense vegetation. Uh, they can also be quite difficult to see, especially the females, as you can see there, which are pretty nondescript little warblers and very good at skulking around in the bushes. Uh, that's not a great photo, but I spent a really long time trying to take that photo. Uh, so I've, that's the best I've got and I'm going with it. Um, the males, the singing males will actually perch on exposed twigs, which makes them a little bit easier to see. And of course, their coloration is a lot more um, standout-ish. Uh, so again, we've got a small warbler here. Um, they, they have uh, this really nice black mask, which makes them stand out, the breeding males do, and then a white border on top. They've got a yellow throat, as the name would suggest. And if you look at the undertail coverts on this guy, you've got yellow undertail coverts. Um, this is not a bird that you see so much from underneath because these guys do tend to stick closer to the ground, but it's still useful to know. Uh, the females, as I said, are pretty drab. Um, they do have a yellow throat and breast, but it doesn't tend to be super bright. Uh, interestingly, the brightness of this yellow um, throat and breast, it varies geographically. Uh, so this one's pretty pale, but in other places they can be a lot brighter and then they're brownish above. Now the song that the common yellow throat sings is basically a witchity, witchity, witchity. That's, that's the song they make. And this is specifically a Newfoundland um, uh, recording here. So I'm still trying to figure out exactly what is different about the Newfoundland songs from the Ontario songs. I think it's almost like there's an extra note in there, but it is quite different. Uh, so it, I definitely wanted to make sure to use a, a Newfoundland song here. So that's our common yellow throat. Okay, and now we'll move on to the American Red Star, which is, I would have to say, one of our most distinctive warblers. Uh, also known as the Halloween bird for obvious reasons because of that bright orange and black coloration. Uh, it's another common breeder in Newfoundland, uh, but it likes deciduous forests. So we don't find it in our you know, primarily coniferous forests. We find it largely in areas with deciduous trees and it likes understories of small trees. Um, interesting thing about red starts, they'll uh, flash. So they've got color patches on their wings and color patches on their tails. And they will flash these brightly colored tails and wings to flush insects out of the foliage, which they then chase around uh, and eat. So you almost don't need IDQs, at least for the breeding male American red start. Uh, you've got a mainly black bird and you've got these bright orange patches on the sides, on the wings and on the tail. Uh, the female, as, as per usual, is a little bit duller. Uh, you've got a gray head, an olive back, and then instead of orange patches, we have yellow patches on the sides, the wings, and the tails. Something to keep in mind though with red starts is they have what we call delayed plumage maturation. So this plumage, this dark uh, black and orange uh, striking plumage, males don't actually molt into that until their second breeding season. So their first breeding season, when we confusingly call them second year males, so they hatch one summer, the next summer they're second years, and uh, that's their first breeding season, they look like the females. Um, so they, they will sometimes have variable amounts of black on the face and chest, but mostly they're this gray and yellow coloration. Uh, but that doesn't stop them from attempting to hold territories and attract females but most of them don't have any luck with that until the next year when they've gained this adult plumage. So females by far prefer these mature adult males. Um, one of the things that I noticed last summer is we seem to have an awful lot of these second year males in the female plumage uh, singing here in Newfoundland. So I'm really intrigued by that um, because I, I don't think, I only saw the mature um, red start plumage a few times. Mostly it was these immature, or sorry, not immature, but second year males. 
I have not included the Red Start song here. Uh, and that's because it is not an easy song. It's what they're one of the most variable warblers and uh, they actually drive me totally nuts. Um, I had one come to me when I was, uh, I thought it was a Magnolia warbler and it came and sang the Magnolia warbler song directly in my face. I could see that it was a red start singing it. Uh, so these guys are tricky. They can be quite different, uh, difficult to distinguish from Magnolia warblers sometimes, sometimes from yellow warblers. Uh, so this one is a, a challenging song, but I do love red starts. And one of the reasons that I love them is uh, the lab that I did my graduate work in, a lot of the work coming out of that lab was actually on American red starts. And uh, I didn't study them myself, but one of my good friends did. And they're really well known in the ornithology world because they're one of the first species where the existence of carryover effects was demonstrated. So this is just a, a little bit of a side uh, tangent here. But for most migratory birds in North America, we know a lot about what happens to them on the breeding grounds because that's where they're studied. But we really don't know much about what goes on during the rest of their annual cycle. So their migration south where they spend the winter, their migration back north in the spring. And that's really more than half the year that they spend doing those activities. So we have this brief insight into about three months of their lives, but that's it. Uh, and of course, the challenge there is it's very difficult to follow small individual birds throughout their entire annual cycle. Um, but we, it's something that we really need to do because it's silly of us to imagine that the events of the breeding season happen in isolation from the rest of the year. So carryover effects are defined as when events in one season affect the outcome of the subsequent season. And in red starts, uh, we actually had a number of studies in the early 2000s, which showed that Red start males that spent the, the winter in low quality dry habitats in the Caribbean would then come up later to the breeding grounds and do much more poorly than males that had overwintered in high quality wet habitats like mangrove swamps. Uh, and this actually started a whole new field of research about carryover effects. So uh, I always think of carryover effects when I think of red starts. They're not the only species that have demonstrated them many. We have demonstrated carryover effects in many, many species now, but they were among the first. All right, our next warbler is the Cape May warbler. Um, so most of the species we've talked about so far have been relatively common breeders. These guys are fairly uncommon. Uh, and in fact, if you look at a map of the breeding range of the Cape May Warbler, Newfoundland is not uh, included. They nest in spruce fir forests and are most numerous when spruce bedworms are abundant. Um, and that's important because they have been here in Newfoundland for the past few years. So we currently have a spruce bedworm outbreak happening in Western Newfoundland. Uh, and so we are seeing more Cape, more Cape May Warblers. Um, Cape May warblers have larger clutch sizes, so that's the number of eggs in the nest, than many other warbler species. They have six eggs in most clutches, uh, whereas other warblers we tend to see four or five. Um, and if the fact that they have more eggs may actually allow their populations to expand rapidly when budworm outbreaks occur. Um, these guys will also feed on nectar, like the Tennessee warbler, which I said was a nectar thief, but they're, they're not thieves. And in fact, they actually have a specially shaped tongue. So it's curled and semi-tubular, which allows them to sip nectar from flowers. Uh, and they'll visit flowering trees in spring and they'll actually defend uh, flowers against other birds. Uh, so when I was looking for pictures of Cape May warblers for this presentation, a lot of them were on hummingbird or oriole feeders. Uh, for these guys, we've got a short tail again, um, a thin bill, white undertail coverts here, um, as well as white greater coverts, which are on top of the wing. Um, you've got a nice chestnut colored cheek patch on the male, and then a yellow collar, uh, and black streaks on the chest and flanks. And I just noticed that writing is not easy to read, so sorry about that. I looked better earlier. I will fix that uh, before we send anybody any of the slides. Um, females, again, generally much less dramatic. Uh, so instead of this chestnut cheek patch, you've got a grayish cheek patch, you've got an olive gray crown, a pale yellow collar, and pale yellow breast. Uh, so again, much less dramatic coloration. And I wanted to take a second here just to talk a little bit about spruce bedworms because I did mention them. Uh, so these are the caterpillars of a native North American moth. 
that feeds on balsam fir and spruce. Uh, so it likes white spruce, but will also feed on red and black spruce. Um, and basically they start eating at the top of the tree and they'll eat all of the current year uh, needles. And if there are enough of them, they may also eat previous year needles and even cones. Um, so after four or five years of this, the trees will die of defoliation. And spruce budworm outbreaks are cyclical. So every 30 to 40 years, we have a budworm outbreak. It is part of the natural forest cycle. It's not great for the trees. Uh, it's problematic for logging. Uh, but it does benefit what we call the budworm warblers. So that would be the Tennessee warbler, which we've already talked about, the Cape May warbler, uh, the bay-breasted warbler, and the Blackburnian. And as I said, we do currently have an outbreak in western Newfoundland, which explains why uh, we're seeing more of these warblers at the moment. And apparently my presentation thinks it's time to move on to my next warbler, the northern Perula. Um, this is common throughout the other Atlantic provinces in Eastern Canada. It's rare in Newfoundland. Uh, I have actually never seen one of these guys despite being from Ontario. So this is my goal. I would really, really like to see one of them. Um, one of the neat things about these guys is they build their nests in hanging epiphytes. So that's a, a word for air plants. So things like Spanish moss and beard moss, that's where you're actually going to find a Northern Perula nest. Uh, so if you think you see one breeding, that's definitely something we'd like to know about for the atlas. Things to look for on these, they're a very small warbler. They've got a sharp bill and a short tail, which is often raised the way you see it in this warbler here. Um, in this case, so when I said, uh, when I talked about warbler ID cues, I said you're looking at the shape and the size of the bill usually, but in these guys, the coloration is important too. So they have a yellow lower bill, lower mandible, not the top mandible. So they've almost got a bicolor bill, which is unique to Perulis. Um, they've got this blue gray back. Uh, this is on both sexes. And on both of them, you've got a yellow olive patch in the middle of it. Um, on the male, you've got white eye crescents. You also have them on the female. They're just not as distinct. Um, on both sexes, you have white wing bars. And then on the males in particular, uh, you've got this black and chestnut breastband in the middle of a yellow throat and breast. Um, so this is very distinctive on the males. Immature uh, females are generally duller. They've got less distinct markings. Uh, you see not really as much of a breast band here, a little bit of chestnut, no black at all. Uh, and then immature females actually have a green wash on the back um, and green edged wing feathers as, oppo as opposed to this blue gray. Okay, moving on to the magnolia warbler. Uh, this again is one of our common breeders. It's common in coniferous forests. Um, and as I said, they can sound a little bit like American red starts or red starts can sound like them. Uh, so an easy way to see, to figure out if you're dealing with a magnolia warbler or a red start is to just have a look around at the habitat. Red starts like the deciduous trees, uh, magnolia warblers like coniferous forests. Um, they like forests with close growing young trees or dense understory. And this is another weirdly named warbler like our Nashville and Tennessee warblers. Um, so in 1810, Alexander Wilson collected a warbler from a magnolia tree in Mississippi, and it became known as the magnolia warbler, even though they don't breed in magnolia trees. Obviously, we don't have a lot of those here. Uh, so lots of, lots of things to look at on the uh, magnolia warbler. They've got a relatively long tail. Um, and they've got white undertail coverts with a dark tail tip. Um, and that's useful for uh, identifying this warbler in all plumages. So these white undertail coverts with a dark tip to the tail. Uh, so for the males, you've got a black face mask, you've got a white eyebrow, black back with this white wing panel, um, yellow underneath, and then a black necklace with sort of things trailing down. For, uh, if, trailing ends to it. So it's a bit of a punk necklace, I guess. Um, so females, paler overall, uh, they may have somewhat of a black mask. This was actually a little bit of a discussion between a number of us today because some books show the females with a black mask and others do not. Um, so they do have, they've got a gray head, they've got a white eyebrow and eye ring. They also have white wing bars, like the, the wing panel on the male. They tend to be a little bit narrower and easier to distinguish. So these look more like two separate bars than this here. Um, and then they 
Some of them have the streaks on the breast, but they're generally less bold than the coloration on the, on the males. Okay, and the bay-breasted warbler. Uh, this is another one that I hadn't seen before Newfoundland. I uh, saw it for the first time this summer. Um, it is one of the budworm warblers, so it's not super common here, uh, but it, it is becoming increasingly common with the budworm outbreak. And in fact, in 2020, uh, they were detected breeding in Bergeois Pond Provincial Park uh, near Stephenville for the first time in 11 years. Um, in contrast to some of these populations of warblers, which are relatively stable, uh, bay-breasted warbler numbers depend largely on what's going on with the budworms. So they're abundant during infestations and then they decline or disappear uh, from some areas a few years later. Um, and that's true for some of the budworm warblers, but others like Blackburnian warblers uh, have more varied food sources. And so they're not quite as specialized and they, their population cycles aren't as tied to the budworm outbreaks. Um, these guys are pretty distinctive as well. You're, you're not going to see many that look like a bay-breasted male, a uh, male bay-breasted warbler in breeding plumage. Uh, so you've got a bay or chestnut crown and throat and breast, this black face mask, and then a, kind of a creamy buttery nape of the neck. You've got a dark streaked back and thick wing bars. Um, and then on the female, they're a little bit drabber and paler than the males again, uh, but they do have the same dark streak back. So this uh, dark streaky back is um, consistent between the sexes and they also have thick wing bars and they do have um, a neck patch as well. Uh, the females show variable amounts of this bay or chestnut coloration on their uh, chest, their neck um, and uh, their breast and flanks. And just as a heads up, you know, we, we have talked, or I have mentioned a couple of times that, uh, that uh, warblers look very different in the fall. This is one of the species that looks extremely different. Uh, so it changes quite a bit on fall migration uh, and ends up looking like a species that we'll talk about in a minute, the black pole warbler, even though it looks nothing at all like it in the summer. Blackburnian warblers, again, not incredibly common here in Newfoundland. Um, Probably, I, I think people could argue about this, but maybe the most beautiful species of warbler. They like evergreen and evergreen deciduous forest um, and they're forest canopy specialists. So they are a bird which will give you warbler neck. Uh, that's what some birders will call it. You get a crick in your neck because you spend so much time staring up at the top of the trees. Uh, but I, I think it's worth it for black burning warblers. And in the springtime, um, rival males will actually perform these amazing territorial conflicts by chasing each other through and around treetops, flying in loops and then plummeting downwards. I have not seen this, but I would really like to. Um, so again, they're pretty distinctive. Uh, there are no other North American warblers that have an orange face and throat. Uh, so this brilliant flame coloration is uh, very distinctive for black, to black burning warblers. Um, they have this triangular black ear patch here and a black crown uh, for the males. Females are, as per usual, duller and paler overall. Um, they have a yellow eyebrow uh, and throat here, um, not the bright orange. And then they, they still have a triangular ear patch, but it's not black, it's gray, uh, and two white wing bars. All right, how are we doing for time? Okay, we're, we're getting through it. We're getting through our warblers here. Um, so yellow warblers are perhaps our most easily visible common warbler. Uh, for fairly obvious reasons, they really stand out. Um, whenever somebody tells me that they have seen a canary, which happens more often than you might think, um, this is probably what they're talking about, either this or an American goldfinch. Uh, so these guys are found in riparian thickets and young forests and along roadsides. These guys are pretty easy in terms of what habitat they like. Um, they have a wide breeding range. They breed all across North America and into Alaska also throughout Mexico and Central America. And it's probably pretty easy to imagine that they face some really different challenges uh, across a breeding range that, that wide. So for example, a bird breeding in Alaska is not going to experience the same climate as a bird breeding in Ontario. And a few years ago, a couple of researchers showed that one of the ways the species deals with this variation is by building very different nests. Uh, so a friend of mine from grad school compared nests of warblers breeding in Churchill, Manitoba, with those breeding in eastern Ontario, 
And they found that the warblers breeding in Churchill built larger, less porous nests that retained heat better, but took a little bit longer to dry out um, than the warblers that were breeding in uh, Eastern Ontario. Uh, so these guys are pretty distinctive too. They're small. Uh, they've got a pretty stout bill, pretty substantial bill, um, and they're bright yellow all over. Uh, they've got these chestnut streaks on the breast, the males do, and a pretty unmarked face. So they're just overall yellow with a yellow green back. Uh, females are not quite as bright, but you've still got this overall yellow coloration. Uh, you don't have any streaks on the underparts generally, you've still got that yellow green back. Um, this song was also one of the first that I learned, and if they're singing, there's a uh, sort of super diagnostic song, which uh, some people, the, the mnemonic that I've heard is sweet, sweet, I'm so sweet. It's pretty easy to identify. But uh, yellow warblers are also highly variable in their song, and uh, so you do see a lot of difference in, in what they sing. Mm -hmm. Okay, the black pole warbler. Um, these guys are common in Newfoundland. Uh, they like the cold, wet regions of the island where balsam fir forests or tuckamore um, grow. And for those of you who aren't familiar with tuckamore, those are the spruce trees that are all bent and entangled by winds on the coast of Newfoundland. Uh, it's really neat stuff. It's not great if you have to walk into it to chase birds, but otherwise it's pretty amazing. Um, their breeding range is the farthest north of all the warblers, uh, and so living in southern Ontario before this, they were not one I had come across. ID cues for the black pole warbler. This black cap is where it gets its name. Um, it's got a, the males have a nice white cheek. They've got white wing bars, black streaking on the back and flanks, and then they've got these orange legs, uh, which are a good thing to pay attention to. That is, uh, that is an easy way to identify black pole warblers. Uh, the females have a broken eye ring, finely streaked cap, they've got a dark eye line, and a yellow wash on the breast and head, but they do still have these two wing bars. Um, and they do still have the orange legs, orange yellow legs. Uh, the song of the black pole warbler is one of the highest frequency songs of all warblers. Uh, it's very distinctive, but it's also one of the first ones that people lose when they start losing their hearing. So it has been called nature's hearing test. So I will play it um, and hopefully most of us will be able to hear it. But if you can't hear anything, it's not because there's no recording there. It's because it's really high pitched. So it's that sort of lisping high pitched note. I'd be interested to know uh, if there were people that could not hear that or, or how many people did hear it. So if you wanna drop a note in the chat, I'd be interested to know that. Um, and something interesting about black pole warblers. Uh, one of the things that I consider the coolest about them is that they have one of the longest warbler migrations. So birds in Western North America, in Alaska, for example, will actually travel 16,000 kilometers from Alaska to Brazil and then back every year. Uh, on the other side of the continent, the warblers don't have to go as far, but they actually win the award for the longest nonstop journey over water. Uh, so they'll fly more than 3,000 kilometers straight over water from the northeastern US to the Caribbean or to South America. Uh, so that's a nonstop journey of roughly three days. So we're talking about a bird that weighs less than half an ounce, but they actually hold the record for the longest overwater journey of any songbird, which I think is really, really cool. Uh, this, of course, means that they have to stock up on energy before they leave, and they actually double their body mass before they go on migration. Now, I did mention before that it's really, really difficult for us to track individual birds throughout their entire annual cycle. They're really hard to follow, especially when they weigh less than half an ounce. So how is it that we know this about black pole migration? Well, in part, it's due to a lot of technological advances. And I just wanted to highlight this one because it's a system that Birds Canada runs, the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System. Um, so what it does, MODIS uses these little tiny tags, very lightweight, that we put on birds, including the black pole. I believe this is an Ipswich sparrow, uh, but they have, we have tagged black poles as well. And each of these tags admits a radio frequency, a unique radio frequency. And this radio frequency is picked up by these stationary towers. Um, 
which allows us to track individuals as they move from tower to tower. Uh, so for this to work, we need a lot of towers, but currently there are more than 1,200 of them that have been set up in 31 countries on four continents, and they're still working to expand this network. Um, and so it's a really cool system because no matter who tags a bird, any of these towers will pick it up. Uh, it's very collaborative, and it's helping us make some really, really cool discoveries about animal movement. Okay, I've got to finish this off here. I got too distracted by the interesting stuff about warblers. Uh, so we'll go through the last few species. Um, this is the palm warbler. It's a relatively large warbler. Um, it likes open areas, so bogs and fens with uh, borders of spruce trees. I saw them a lot this summer along power line cuts and in weedy fields. Uh, again, we've got a misna misleading name. Um, so it was based, the palm warbler was based on where it was first seen during the winter in the Caribbean, but it's actually one of our most northern breeding warblers. Uh, the only warbler that breeds further north is the Blackpool warbler. Um, identification cues for the palm warbler. Here we've got a case of monomorphic sexes, so uh, the males and the females look the same. Um, we've got a rusty cap, this bright yellow eyebrow, rusty streaks on the breast, and yellow underparts. And their song is a monotonous kind of buzzy trill. It sounds a bit like an insect. Okay. And we're down to our last few species. Um, the yellow rumped warbler, affectionately nicknamed the butterbutt for obvious reasons. Um, one of the first warblers to arrive back to Newfoundland in the spring. Um, and they're really versatile foragers. So they will eat pretty much anything. Well, they eat insects in a variety of locations, I guess I should say. So they'll pick at them from washed up seaweed, they'll skim them from the surface of rivers and oceans, uh, they'll pick them out of spider webs, and they're quick to switch to eating berries during the fall and winter. And uh, interestingly, they're the only warbler able to digest the waxes found in bay berries and wax myrtles. Uh, and so because it can use these fruits, it can winter further north than other warblers. Um, ID cues for these guys, we have yellow side patches, a yellow rump, a black face mask, and a white throat. Um, it's worth noting that there are two subspecies of yellow rumped warblers. This is the eastern subspecies, also called the myrtle warbler. Uh, the western subspecies, Audubon's warblers, uh, look quite different and they have a yellow throat rather than a white. Um, but the yellow rump is diagnostic and it's diagnostic for both males and females and uh, both subspecies. Um, so females, we've got the white throat, uh, we've got more of a brown above, there is a yellow rump under there, and there are some yellow patches on the side. Black-throated green warblers, uh, again a common warbler, they like mature coniferous uh, and mixed woodlands, and they, they also tend to stay high up in the canopy like the Blackburnians, uh, so there can be some warbler neck involved in seeing them. Um, and it's also good to be familiar with what their undersides look like. Uh, so for these guys, we've got a dusky ear patch here. We've got this black throat, as you might guess from the names. Um, we've got a yellow face, a green back, sort of an olive green, and black streaking on the sides. Uh, the females are similar, but instead of the black throat, we've got a white throat, but you've still got the dusky ear patch and the yellow face and the black streaking. Uh, and the song is really distinctive and they repeat it a lot. So it's a really good one to start uh, your bird ID with. So one male black throated green warbler was heard singing 466 times in one hour. Uh, and one mnemonic that's been used for it is trees, trees, I love trees. Oh, sorry, here's our green back. Uh, and you should note the yellow wash across the vent. Uh, so again, knowing what the underside of the warbler looks like can be really important. Uh, so we've got these white wing bars, which you can see on the male as well, the green back, and then the yellow wash across the vent, and that's also true for both sexes. Trees, trees, I love trees. All right, and one final diversion before we talk about our very last warbler. Uh, we're nearly there. Some of you have probably noticed by now that many of the species that we're talking about tonight share the same habitat preference. So I've said, you know, likes mature coniferous forest quite a bit. So how do all of these warblers manage to coexist? And this is a longstanding question in community ecology, or the study of species interactions, the question of how 
multiple species uh, manage, that seem to share the same niche manage to exist in the same place. Um, and so in the 1950s, a Canadian born ecologist, Robert MacArthur set out to answer this question for five species of warblers that share the same breeding grounds in mature coniferous forest. So the Cape May, the yellow rumped, the black throated green, the black Burnian, and the bay breasted warbler, all of which we have here in Newfoundland. And he wanted to know how all of them managed to coexist without out competing each other. And what he found is that they didn't actually, in fact, occupy the same niche. They actually split up the available space amongst themselves. Uh, so the Cape May spent most of its time at the top of the trees on the outside. And then the Black Burnian occupied the area just below the top on the outside. Black throated Green was about the same height as the Black Burnian, but more towards the interior. Bay Breasted Warbler occupied the middle interior. And then Yellow Rumped moved around a lot, but spent most of its time at the base of the trees. Um, and he also found that the foraging habits of each differed. Uh, and so he contributed a lot to our understanding of how these similar warbler species can coexist in the same habitat. All right, and our final warbler species, as I promised, uh, these guys are common breeders, uh, but unlike the black-throated green warblers, they spend most of their time in the understory and they're actually ground nesters. Uh, they like wet meadows and thickets near streams. Uh, we saw them all the time in the alder hedges this last summer. And uh, interestingly, unlike other songbirds, so in most songbirds, when the young fledge from the nest, they don't go back. But some Wilson's warbler fledglings will fledge from the nest and then come back to it and spend a few more nights in it. Uh, so ID cues for these guys, they're one of the smallest warblers. Um, they've got small, thin bill and a beady black eye. It's hard to define beady exactly, but you can tell by looking at it what they mean there. Um, the uh, adult males will have this black cap as well as an olive back and they're entirely yellow below. Uh, the females and the immatures, again, a little bit duller. You'll see an olive crown, sometimes a little bit of black, uh, but you see the olive back and all yellow below. And just a final comparison here. Uh, looking at the female yellow versus Wilson's warblers. Uh, so that can be a little bit of a challenge as well. Uh, Wilson's warblers are going to be quite a bit smaller than the yellow warblers. Uh, and then this crown, whether it's olive or has a little bit of black in it, is quite diagnostic. Uh, they've also got a nice yellow eyebrow, uh, whereas the yellow warbler has a very plain face. Uh, and then if you look at the yellow warbler, the edging of the wing feathers is yellow, whereas that is not the case on the Wilson's warbler. Uh, but these guys can be a little bit tricky. The size difference is only useful if you've got something to compare it to. All right, so that is it for the warblers. And I have actually exceeded our time. I got went on too many tangents there of the interesting warbler facts. Um, but because people really enjoyed the quiz, uh, I do have a quiz tonight with eight birds in it. If you want to stick around for the quiz, please do so. If you don't, please feel free to leave and we'll hopefully see you next week. Um, but for those of you who do want to do the quiz, I will launch this one now. So if you can't see the bird, I've tried to keep it to one side so you're able to see it. But if you can't see it, you can grab the pole and you can drag it off to the side. Uh, so what, what species do we have here? See the answers coming in. Okay, looks like most people have answered. Give it a couple more minutes in case anyone wants to. All right, and we'll stop it there. So by far the majority of you, 84% of you got it right. This is a bay-breasted warbler. It's got that really distinctive bay coloration on the throat and on the flanks, and then on the top of its head, although you can't see that terribly well. Uh, and it's got these two nice wing bars. We did have a few people guess American red starts. Uh, that is another one of the darker warblers and it does have that bright uh, orange coloration, uh, but this one's definitely, definitely not quite as bright and striking as the uh, American red start. Okay, so here we have our bay breasted. Next warbler, what have we got here? Okay. 
So we'll launch that poll and see what people think. Okay, and people are very fast to answer this one, it looks like. All right, so I'll end it there and share the results. And again, we've got 85% of people that got this correct. This is a Blackburnian warbler uh, with this bright orange coloration to the throat and to the head. That's unique among North American warblers. Common yellow throat, I put that one in on purpose, easy mistake to make, um, but it is, it's not an orange throat, it's a yellow throat. And then common yellow throats have the, the black mask with the white on top. They don't have this black and orange crown uh, and they don't have the little triangular mark there. Um, the yellow warbler would be entirely yellow and the yellow rumped warbler would actually have a white throat. Okay. All right, so Blackburnian. Okay, what about this guy? What do we have here? Ooh, people are slower on this one. This one's a bit trickier for sure. All right, I'll just give it a couple more seconds. So if you're on the fence, place your votes. All right, we've got 81% participation. Uh, so on this one, you guys were a lot more split and that's totally understandable. 36% uh, of you or 36 of you got it right. It is a Nashville warbler. Um, cues that you could be looking for, that little bit of chestnut coloration in the crown, which is often quite hard to see. The gray hood, uh, the yellow underside there, uh, and there is a white eye ring. It's a little bit tricky to see. Um, morning warbler, you would expect to see uh, black on the chest here, and you would not expect to see that eye ring. Uh, yeah, Tennessee warbler, again, I very often get confused, but much more drab coloration to it. Um, yeah, oops, sorry, I just realized I didn't actually share those results, so you couldn't actually see what I was talking about, but I basically just narrated them for you. Okay, so. Um, that's our Nashville warbler. Okay, and what about this guy? I keep clicking on the participants instead of launching the poll. There we go. Poll launched. What have we got here? Okay, the answers are a little slower on this one, very clearly split between two species. All right, I'll finish it in just a second. So place your votes if you haven't placed them yet. All right, and I'm gonna stop it. And this time I'll remember to share the results. Uh, so as you can see, we're pretty, pretty split between the oven bird and the northern water thrush, which is what I thought might happen. Uh, so both of these, remember, are sort of almost non-warbler looking, uh, often seen on the ground species. 
this is actually an oven bird. Uh, so 48% of you got it right. Um, cues that you can be looking for to see that it's an oven bird. Well, first of all, the back is that sort of olivey brown color as opposed to that dark brown color. Um, and you've got this eye ring as opposed to the buffy eyebrow that you see on a northern water thrush. Um, you can't really see the orange crown from here. You can see a little bit of a black stripe, but you can't see much of the orange crown, uh, but that is often not seen. So uh, it's, it's good to be able to identify them without it. All right, great job. And we'll stop sharing that. We're halfway there. Uh, so that's our oven bird. Okay, and we'll launch the poll for this one. Who do we have here? Okay, we've got 80% have participated. I'll close it in a second. So place your votes. Anybody else who has thoughts on these guys? Oh yeah, we're seeing the participation climb. And again, we've got a pretty sure answer from most people on this one. All right, I will end it and share the results. Uh, so the vast majority of you answered black and white warbler and you are correct. Uh, does anybody remember whether it's a male or a female? Put that in the chat if you remember. A um, couple people guessed black pole warbler. And again, that, that was one that I uh, included on purpose. Um, and I included it because uh, they, they can easily be confused. With the black pole, remember you're looking for that, uh, that little black cap, essentially. That's, that's your big cue as opposed to all of this black streaking. Um, all right, so let's just have a look at the chat and see what people are saying. Everybody is saying that it is a male black and white warbler and you are correct, it is indeed a male. Nice job. All right, and just a couple more. Okay, who do we have here? It's a little bit blurry, I know. Okay, I will close it in a minute. So place your guesses. All right, doesn't look like we're gonna hit 80% with this one. I know the photo is a little bit difficult. Unfortunately, when you see birds in, in the wild, they often aren't in perfect view. So it's good to get used to looking at not always perfect photos of them. All right, I will end the poll here, share the results. So people were a little bit more split on this one. Um, it is indeed an American red start. It's a female or a young male. Uh, so we've got the gray and yellow coloration here. Um, doesn't have a yellow throat, it's got a white throat, so not a common yellow throat. Doesn't have a black throat, so not a black throated green warbler. Um, Tennessee warbler, remember Tennessee warblers are pretty plain looking. So the coloration here and the wing bar uh, and the color in the wing and on the tail, that's not something you'd see in a Tennessee warbler. Okay, just two more to go. Uh, all right. So who do we have here?
Okay, we'll get a few more guesses. This one, seem, people seem pretty, pretty sure of as well. It's kind of fun to watch the answers come in. Okay, and we are over 80%, just a few minutes. Place your guesses if you're on the fence. Anyone else? All right, I will end it there. Uh, so most of you got that it's a northern perula. Yep, that is true. Uh, you've got this, um, you've got the, the white eye ring, the, um, or the broken eye ring there. You've got the um, olive gray spot on a blue gray back. Uh, you've got these two wing bars. You've got the chestnut collar here. Um, common yellow throat, it does have a yellow throat. So yep, I can understand that mistake. For the male common yellow throat though, you're looking for that black mask with the white edging at the top. Uh, and the female common yellow throats, remember, are pretty drab, bir drab birds. Uh, and then the yellow rumped warbler, you'd be looking for a white throat. Okay, and our very last bird, our last mystery bird of the day. Okay. So who do we have here? All right, this one's a bit trickier. People are a bit slower to answer. It's not super common in Newfoundland, if that helps. We'll just give it a few more seconds. All right, any more guesses? Okay, I'm gonna stop the poll there. Uh, so again, we do have a majority getting it right. This is a Cape May warbler. Um, we did have some other guesses though, and that's totally understandable. Uh, palm warbler, you're looking for a rusty cap, not a rusty face, but an understandable mistake. Um, oh, thank you, Jenna. I forgot to share again, didn't I? I appreciate you taking up the slack there. Um, Blackburnian warbler, you've got a yellow throat here as opposed to that flame colored throat. Uh, and magnolia warbler, the streaking on the breast would be quite similar, but uh, you'd be looking for a necklace with a um, breast streak across and not the different facial patterns. Okay, well, I'll stop sharing that. And thank you to those of you who stuck it out till the end. I know we went way over today. I apologize. That's my warbler enthusiasm coming out. Um, feel free to contact us anytime with any questions. And uh, yeah, we will we'll send you a follow up to this and we hope to see many of you next week. Have a great week. Hi, Catherine. Very well Hi. done. Um, I just wanted to say just in case the person who asked this question is still here. Someone asked if yellow rump warblers are the only ones with a yellow rump. Um, and maybe they're gone, but if you're still here, um, there are a few others that have yellow sort of on the lower back area. So that could be a bit confusing if you only get a quick peek, um, but the yellow rump warbler is really all, the only one with yellow on like the lower, like top of the tail, really rump area. Um, the magnolia warbler will have yellow on the lower back. Um, yellow warbler has all yellow on its back and the palm wool warbler will also have some yellow on um, the lower back. Thank you, Jenna. And we're just getting lots of thanks is coming in. We had a little chat about modus towers earlier. Nice. Um, and whether there's some on the island. And there there's is only one, one on the here. island. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then some folks were saying we should get some more, which would be fantastic. <laughs> I am all for that. Yes. Um, and someone's asking if there's a good bird song app available. And someone answered in the chat, but I'll say it out loud. Um, that Merlin is a good app that you can um, listen to songs on for free. Um, and it also has a capability now where you can um, use it 
to ID songs as well. Um, it's a work in progress, but it's pretty good actually at, at getting correct identifications. I will add to that that I myself am a big fan of LarkWire. Um, unlike Merlin, LarkWire is not free. I think you have to pay about $25 for it, uh, but it turns learning bird song into a game, which I find helps me a lot. Um, and I also noticed that Teresa has also asked, where is the picture? What trail is it? That's um, Cobbler's Path near St. John's. And yes, okay, you, Marie, tell Nature NL that you're looking for the fall warbler event because I think that, you know, they did winter gulls, which are tricky. Fall warblers are super tricky too. So I'm hoping we can convince them. Okay. Uh, can we include the bird song app in the follow up email? Yes, I can definitely do that. Next week is going to be sparrows, finches, and grosbeaks. So that'll be next Monday. Okay. No worries. All right, well, it looks like the questions are slowing down. So uh, I'll say thank you all again for coming. Really appreciate it. It's great that people are so interested. It's really, really gratifying. Uh, and we will see you next week. Perfect. Thanks so much, Catherine. It was a great presentation, as always. Thank you.